Hey, welcome to the Elijah Rising podcast. Elijah Rising is an organization empowering women recovering from sexual exploitation. This episode is going to help you become more informed about the issue of sex trafficking and inspire you to take action. Hey, welcome. I'm Adam, and today I'm joined by Amber Knowles. Amber is the executive director of Fostering Family, a nonprofit committed to strengthening foster and kinship families in their communities through training and collaboration. Welcome to the podcast, Amber. Thanks for having me. Excited to have you uh, on the podcast today. And so today, the question that we're asking is, uh, why should we pay attention to foster care? And maybe a little bit more to the point is like, what is the connection between the foster care system and the issue of sex trafficking? It's a question we get often, and I think there is often this idea that there is a connection. Um, but I think for a lot of people, we don't actually know what that is, or there's yeah. a lot of assumptions that are made uh, about the connection. So that's what we're going to get into today. Uh, that's the purpose of the episode, and we're really, really thankful that you've chosen to, uh, to join us. So thanks for being here. Thanks. So um, let's just set the context. Uh, you know, who is, what is fostering family? What do y'all do? Uh, and, and, and why do you do it, maybe? Like, what is the need for foster care in the Houston area specifically? Sure. Um, well, there's a few things that we do okay. at Fostering Family to strengthen and support foster families. Um, the first one that we do is a babysitting collaborative, um, and that is mainly geared toward getting support around foster and kinship families. Gotcha. Um, and just to define kinship families, yeah, are, what is yeah, you, you've <laughs> made that distinction. It's a harder term. Yeah, to, yeah. Go for it. Um, I'd love to define that. So, yeah. kinship families are really relative caregivers. So, okay. um, when a kid goes into foster care, they may be placed with a foster family, which is what we often hear about. Right. Um, but a lot of times, they're actually placed with relatives. So they may like be a grandmother, a grandparent. Or an it may be an aunt, it might be even a neighbor. They don't oh. even have to be specifically related, but obviously the goal is if they can't be with their parents, sure. we'd want them to be with um, someone that they feel comfortable with. Someone so they're they, familiar with. Yeah. So yeah. they try to put them with um, a family member if possible. Wow. Okay. Um, and so those are kind of termed kinship caregivers. Gotcha. So just because um, we're focused on foster care doesn't mean that we exclude those who are taking care of um, their family members as well who yeah, might that's be awesome. in the foster yeah. care system. So um, through our babysitting collaborative, we um, early on we realized that a lot of these families do not have support around them. Mm. Um, and one of the best ways that their communities can come around them is through babysitting, giving them a night away, yeah. um, being a, a person that can step in in an emergency situation. Um, the problem is when a kid is in the system or in foster care, um, you can't just have your sister babysit for them. So yeah. you have to have someone who is background checked, someone right. who is fingerprinted, someone who is trained, yeah. someone has CPR certification, things like that. And so what we have done is worked with now 21 child placing agencies who have agreed to let us train wow. foster family babysitters. Um, so we, we just do that through a tr streamlined training process so that families... Um, foster and kinship families can just send their friends and family a link and we take it from there. We get all of the stuff ready to go. Wow. Um, and then we send it over to their agency to get it just checked off and approved. So you make it easy. So we make it really easy. Yeah. Um, website, just go to the website. We'll take it from there. And it's been a huge support. I think th since August of 2018, we've certified or trained for certification over 300 babysitters. Here wow. In that's incredible. Support families. That's incredible. Um, so yeah, we do a lot of that work. Um, we also uh, work with churches and community leaders through an initiative called the Riverside project. Okay. Um, we do um, with that, we try to equip and mobilize churches to understand the need and then find their place sort of um, in in this sort of foster care space of mm. we, we talk to church leaders all the time and they say, we know that this is a big problem. Um, we hear all the statistics. We yeah. just don't know what to do about yeah, it. Yeah. And so we're able to come around them, ask them about their church. What are your assets as a church? What can you do? And mm. then try to match that to the need in their specific context in their neighborhood. Mm. Um, and so we do a lot of that as well. Um, and that would be more than just like, hey, have your congregants right. uh, adopt or foster. Mm -hmm. You're talking about like more supportive systems and things yes. like that. Yeah, okay. there's a yeah. lot more to do 
than just foster care. Right, um, right. Just I, not everyone can foster. Not everyone should sure. foster, really. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but there's so many more ways to step in, and churches are a great um, a great place to be able to do that and rally their people around. Yeah, well, to and there's for foster churches parents. everywhere too, right? They're right. embedded in every single community, so they they have a lot of resources to be able to step into that gap. That's so yeah. cool. What yeah. else? Um, the other thing that we've really been focusing on lately has been through leadership and a coalition in the child welfare space here in Houston. Um, we were kind of invited to that that table and asked to provide some leadership because we're a collaborative organization. Yeah. Um, we have kind of quickly been able to um, get kind of a seat at that table and, and provide some, some leadership. Um, in the child welfare space. So mm. we're working with agency leaders, we're working with the FPS, we're working with educators and pediatricians to say, okay, here is the system that we're trying to affect change in. Yeah. How do we do that and work together? And so we're recognizing gaps um, and then figuring out how to get the right people in the right places um, and then where to step in and, and what yeah. things we can do to, to you know, fix the system yeah. um, or, or make it more... Um, just improved um, sure. for the sake of vulnerable kids. Yeah. yeah. And, and how many, um, you said it's a collaborative, it's, it's mm-hmm. a Houston based yeah. uh, collaborative. And like, how many agencies or groups would you say is probably participating in that? Gosh. Um, there's, there's a lot. Really? Um, and, yeah. and it's growing every day. So, That's great. a couple of, uh, about a year and a half ago, there was a, just a big assessment that was done on Houston's child welfare system, yeah. um, trying to recognize what's happening here in our city um, with our kids and where are the main gaps that we're seeing. Um, and then out of that, four work groups were created. Um, it's called Coalition for Child Serving Sectors is what, okay. this is, what it's actually called. Um, four work groups were created to really start looking at specific parts of that. One is on the community leaders. One of is one of them is on providers. So hmm. the agencies, DFPS, all of those like providers. Right. Um, one's for fiscal planning, and one is for data collection and, and data. Um, and so we, I was asked to actually chair the provider work group, and awesome. so I'm able to, with another co-chair, um, work with you know leaders at Depelchin, leaders yeah. at CPS, leaders at all of these different agencies to figure out how do we how do we work together and do this. Um, That's so encouraging so. to hear, Amber, because you know obviously. I, I just hear a lot of echoes of our work and like what it takes to actually address a problem that is so large yeah. and has so many different facets that are yeah. broken. Um, it takes a lot of collaboration, not just from like faith-based NGOs, you know, like ourselves, yeah. but like, you know, you need buy-in from the community and from the church and from the municipality and you need buy-in yeah. from a lot of different agencies working together to tackle all the different gaps. And it, yeah. it's really encouraging to hear that um, the foster care system is getting that attention as well. Yeah, and I think it's not just about getting everyone to the table. It's actually coordinating the pieces in such sure. a way that it's effective and creating the change that we want to see. Yeah, right? yeah. So um, there's a lot of people that need to be involved, but even if there's lots of different silos and everyone's kind of trying to do their part, if they're not connected and working work. well together, it's not yeah. going to work. Yeah. Um, so we've been really, really grateful to be just that people would trust us um, to provide leadership in that. Yeah. And I think because we are a neutral organization, we're not an agency, we're not CPS, we're right. not one specific church. Um, we actually get to kind of be kind of the hub and the wheel to c- bring connection to all of those key players in wow. such a way that it kind of pulls them together. Yeah. Um, so we're really grateful to have um, just the humility um, of all of those people to yeah. step in and say, okay, this organization hasn't been around for a very long time, but um, we trust them to really help strengthen some of the work yeah. that we're doing. So we're that's really in- grateful. That's incredible. Um, we've kind of, we've kind of hinted at this already, but the next thing I was hoping to ask is, this, you know, I, I have this sense and I think probably a lot of our listeners or viewers have this sense that, um, well, there's just like a common perception, I think, in our in our society that the foster care system in this country is broken, mm-hmm. right? That there's something wrong, um, and it's 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 either failing or has failed or is on its way to failure or some or somewhere in between there on that mm-hmm. spectrum. Um, and so, as somebody who's in this space, I, I just want to ask the question: like, is that true? Is that is that mm-hmm. perception true? Um, and to what degree, if it is true, not to assume, but if it yeah. is true, like to what degree is it broken? That's a good question. Um, I think that it's it's true in the sense that the world is broken. Okay. So yeah, we just like every other system in the every world. other yeah. system in the world, <laughs> yeah. every every system and problem that we're trying to fix in a fallen world sure. is broken. You yeah. know, um, yeah. and so I, I think. 
on some level, yes, there have been some really difficult things that have happened and things that aren't necessarily fixing what we want it to fix. Yeah. Um, and like you, you nailed it earlier when you said it, it requires the coordination of a lot of different people. And sure. so I think what's driving the brokenness, if you want to call it that, um, is as a, a result of two different things. I think one, it, it re, it's complex. It's too complex to, to handle and yeah. to fix um, just from one organization or government. There's no entity. simple There's solution. There's no perfect solution to right. it. And so to say, well, it's broken, yeah. it is broken, but it's broken because it's, it's such a hard thing to tackle. Sure. Um, the reality is parents can't always take care of their own kids. And that's a terrible reality that we live in. Yeah. Um, and there's not like a one specific solution. Yeah. You know, it, it's definitely complex and it's, it's going to require a lot. Yeah. Um, the other thing that I think goes into it that's really important is um, just that from where we sit, I think a lot of times the church and the community has sort of abdicated our responsibility to sure. step into these things. Um, and so we kind of put it on governmental entities or, well, nonprofits can take care of that issue. Yeah. Um, and they're kind of doing that over here. But the reality is with this particular issue, and I think with trafficking too, you've seen that, that yeah. um, we, we can't rely just on one you know program that's going to fix this entire yeah. thing. The community and the church, I really believe, has to step in and make a real um, tangible effort yeah. around this in order for it to not be broken again. Yeah, I just um, I'm I'm continually struck listening to you. Um, you know, one of the things one of the, one of my roles here with our team is to help us think about the way that we're messaging, mm -hmm. not just the problem, but the solution of trafficking um, problems, solutions, plural. Uh, and like I'm listening to you, and I'm like, she. We are saying we are speaking the same language. Yeah. We are saying the same things. Like there is so much overlap to like the yeah. way that you're communicating what's going on. Um, that I'm kind of just blown away uh, by that, and it, which is a great segue into what's the link, right? Like that's yeah. the that's the point of our conversation today. Like what is the link between trafficking and the foster care system? Because it sounds like we are trying to wrap our hands around a very in a very similar way a very similar issue. So help us understand that connection. Yeah. The way that we typically explain um, some of these links is with the idea of a river. Okay. So there's this parable. It came from, I think it came from the healthcare industry, but you may have heard it before. But essentially, you're walking along the, the side of a river with okay. a couple of friends, um, and you see a kid coming down the river in mm -hmm. the water. Well, of course, you jump in and you pull him out. Um, then you see another kid coming down the river. Well, you jump in and you pull him out. You see more kids coming down the river, and you're just trying to get these kids out and onto the this, this side of the river into mm. stability and dry ground. Um, eventually, you start thinking there's a waterfall downstream, and mm. if I, like, one of us has to go down and try to figure out, you know, keep these kids from going over the waterfall. So right. you send somebody downstream. Um, then you start realizing why are these kids in the river in the first yeah, place? Yeah, there's a problem we have upstream. To put, yeah, there's something going on upstream as to like putting these kids in the river. So you send somebody else going upstream. Um, and so you're all attacking the same problem, mm -hmm. but you're just attacking different parts of it at the same time. So what we want to see is um, churches and people all along the river. Um, we see foster care, the middle of that river, kids going into the river who need to get out. Yeah. Um, but upstream, there's a ton of different social issues that are putting them into the system. Yeah. So we, we always talk about how foster care is not an isolated problem. Um, it is a complex, it's, there are several complex issues that are all connected here. Um, and if we attack just foster care, we're completely missing it. Sure. And so, you know, things like homelessness, poverty, lack of education, crisis pregnancy, yeah. those are all upstream reasons why kids filter into the system. They're almost like tributaries that all kind of all these different little issues yeah. funnel into the foster care system, right? Um, if kids don't get out and find stable, loving homes, um, stable, loving adults to, to give them stability on the side of the river, mm. then they go back out into these other tributaries that yeah. go off, right? So um, again, homelessness, some of these are the same things that yeah, were extreme. Yeah. Um, homelessness, poverty, that's where we see trafficking come in. Right. Um, most, I, I think the statistic, I've seen a lot of them, um, but the reality is a, there, there's a supply chain going into trafficking and it's coming from foster care. So these are kids who either, they're older kids who can't find a foster home, kids that are living in group homes, mm. um, if they're not getting to, to stable ground, yeah. they are prime targets for trafficking. Yeah. And so I think the last statistic that I saw was 
Um, I think estimated 60% of child sex trafficking victims who were recovered from raids um, came directly from the foster care system. Yeah, the numbers really are staggering. And, um, you know, one of the things we say in our work of awareness and trying to educate uh, is trafficking, if you were to define trafficking, we, we quote, you know, a researcher, but uh, the quote we use is like, it is, it is the exploitation of vulnerability. And that river you're talking about, that upstream and those tributaries that are downstream, like those are those vulnerabilities. Yep. And aging out of a, of, a, uh, of a group home or all these different vulnerabilities yep. are contributing factors um, that can be exploited by traffickers. But for, uh, help us understand what a group home is. What, what, sure. what did you mean by that term? Well, um, we know that the reality is there's not enough foster homes for kids who need them. Um, and so there are, in Houston, about 35 group homes. Um, these are essential, and so we don't call them orphanages anymore, but they're yeah. essentially group facilities um, where kids are in foster care, but they don't have a foster home available yeah. to them. Uh, for some of them, their behavior needs after being in the foster care system for a long period of time, they've moved from one place to another. Right. Um, I think this, the stat recently that I saw for kids who end up aging out, they've moved on average six or seven times while they've been in foster care. Wow. Um, and so a lot of times they end up in a group facility. Um, and so some of them are still trying to get reunified with their family. Some wow. of them are trying to find a foster home who can take them. Um, and many of them will, will age out of a, of a group home. How many, like what's the, <clears throat> you said 35 homes in the Houston area. Like how many, how many children are each in each one of those? Uh, there's about, I think we looked at it yesterday. There were 433 wow. kids in as of, December, I believe. And what's the age out? Like, what's the age of aging out? 18 usually. Kids okay. can opt to stay in until 21 oh, if really? they want to. Okay. Um, but technically, um, when they turn 18, they're yeah. on their own. So yeah. if you can imagine um, a kid turning 18, their birthday's coming up, and if they don't have a place to go, if they don't have a loving and stable adult who can yeah. help walk them into adulthood successfully... Yeah traffickers are waiting and Absolutely. that's not a dramatic thing to say. It's a reality. Um, there are traffickers who are waiting to prey on kids who all they want is belonging. Yeah. All they want is love. All sure. they want is protection. And if someone's going to offer that to them, yeah. they're going to go. Yeah. Um, we've seen reports of traffickers who, you know, sometimes kids run away from these group homes because of different situations, conflict, sure. trauma, um, and there have been reports of traffickers waiting outside for them to like, run. like literally physically, literally out and outside physically the doors. waiting outside of yeah. them, ready um, to to jump right in. Yeah, um, and that's just it's a it's a difficult reality. Um, and to know a lot of what we've been doing lately has been centered around these group homes and saying these group homes cannot they cannot care for their kids without the outside community caring for right. them. Right, and so we've been trying to when COVID hit, we um, we knew. This is hard for everybody, but for a group home who has 20 kids yeah. living there, and now they have to care for their, you know, their meals 24/7, um, their education, and all of them are at different educational levels. Sure, um, they're trying to keep them occupied. They're well, trying to get them on Zoom to do visits with their different parents. Different traumas, different, yeah, uh, yeah all yeah. kinds of trauma. And so we started thinking this is not going to be good for them. Um, so we started creating Amazon wish lists for them. Mm -hmm. And we went to each one of them and said, what is it that you need? Do you, do you need? need snacks? Do you need food? Do you need games? Do you need basketballs? Do you need Frisbees? Do you need puzzles? Like, yeah. What is it that you need? A, yeah. Video games? I don't care. Just yeah. tell us what you need. Um, and we started going, looking around where they were located and tried to find local churches that could step in. And all we wow. said was, you can commit. You don't have to commit to doing all the things. Yeah, just, just buy commit. a Frisbee. Just buy a Frisbee. Just yeah, get yeah. your people around this Amazon wish list, step in. Um, and the really cool thing is they're now, as things are starting to open up a little bit more, um, that has turned into a lot more relational support. Oh, so, okay, yeah. Funny story, not funny story, a great story. Um, but two weeks ago, I was able to visit a church that was connected to one of these group homes. Um and, and walks these little, these kids. Um, and I just yeah, it started like, weaving. It was the kids that they like, you know, in almost a year ago, we said, can you, can you just provide for them through this Amazon wish yeah. list? And then we did, that's all we did. And they just started building connections there and they started going and tutoring them. Um, they Amazing. started, uh, doing stuff for Christmas and now these kids are 
wanting to know more and they're worshiping with them at their church. So that's what we want to see happen. Sure. And I think that's yeah. what's going to really make a difference for these kids and giving them those relationships that they need so that when they do age out or when yeah. they do leave, um, they have somebody to call. They yeah, have somebody right. that they can rely on as they move forward. Yeah, that's incredible. You guys are doing incredible work. We're going to take a break in the podcast here for uh, just a minute. And when we come back, we're going to talk about some of the roadblocks and misconceptions and um, that you guys encounter in your work. So stick with us. We'll be back in just a minute. Four years ago, we started making candles in my kitchen because we had a dream to empower women recovering from sex trafficking. After years of growing, changing, and perfecting what we truly believe to be the perfect candle, we now sell goods across the country that empower women who are recovering from sex trafficking. And we want you to help us so that we can give more jobs to women that are in our program. Go to shop.elijahrising.org and you can see some of the most amazing goods you've ever tried, as well as empower the next woman to have a future after sex trafficking. And we have a special code for all of our podcast listeners. Just use the code podcast when you check out for a special discount. Welcome back. Amber, um, I would like to know what are some roadblocks? What are some barriers you guys bump up against? I'm sure like every other nonprofit doing social justice work, there's always some sort of wall that you're trying to break down. Uh, but and kind of with that question is like, what are some of the misconceptions that you think people have and that you guys come up against in your work? Sure. Um, I think one of the, f- one of the first ones that comes to mind that we hear all the time is I'm not called a foster um, oh, wow. I don't okay. think I can do that. And therefore there's probably nothing for me to not do. Not my here. issue. It's not my issue. Yeah. I, I, I can't take kids into my home. Um, and so walk away. Yeah. Um, but the reality is like we mentioned earlier, there are lots of ways to get involved. Babysit for a foster. If you know mm-hmm. a foster family, there's stuff to do. Um, <laughs> yeah. there, I can mow their lawn, <laughs> provide childcare, yeah. drop off groceries, like, you know, Caring for kids who come from hard places, who have yeah. trauma in their background, it is hard. Well, I guess, um, it's, hold on, not to interrupt you, but like you just sparked a thought in me. It's like, do you know somebody who's raising a child? Yeah. Do they need your help? Right? We all. Let's be a good neighbor. That's right? The reality. Like, just be a good neighbor. Like, yeah. be aware of who's Maybe next think door. Maybe State Farm. And what the, yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> so that's, I, that's a, I think that's such a great point. It's like, yeah. even though you might not feel called to the issue, it's like, you know what raising kids, we all know what raising yeah. a kid looks like. We all know that that can be difficult no matter what, you know, the, the circumstances right. of that family situation are. Sorry, I cut you off. Keep no, going. No, that's great. Yeah. Um, yeah. So stepping in and just providing help saying, I see you. Yeah. Yeah. I want to know you. I want to know how to help. Um, you are appreciated because mm. the reality is foster and kinship families, there's not a whole lot of people saying thank you um, mm. for the work that they're doing, and it is it's just hard. Well, and they're um, providing a social service, right? Right. That we're all benefiting from. Every citizen is benefiting from the social service of foster families. Yeah. Right. So saying yeah. thank you, yeah. and it's hard. So yeah, tell them thank you, thank you for what you're doing for kids who are vulnerable. Because um, again, if we can't all do that, yeah. then let's thank the ones that are doing it and trying to get support around them. Yeah, it's so good. Um, that that's a, a first place that I would I would say, um, and. With that, I would also say, you know, mentor at a group home. Mm. We have a place on our website where you can um, say, I want to mentor and fill out this mentor interest form, and we can connect you to an organization that does that very well. Um, So step in and and be that loving and caring adult for a kid who may age out of the foster care system uh, or may not find that forever family. And so you can help them into adulthood. Yeah. Um, So you can, you know, do those types of things, engage your church. You know, there's there's a myriad of things that you can do um, to care for kids. Yeah. Yeah. Um, that are in in the foster care system. Um, one of the other things that we hear quite often that's sort of connected to that is, um, and sometimes why people don't want to foster is kids in the foster care system are broken, <laughs> and I don't know if they can be healed. Oh, um, yeah. And so I don't know if I have what it takes to care for a kid like that. Mm. Um, and I understand where that's coming from. That's it, there's a big fear in that. Um, the reality though, is that we've come a really long way in understanding what happens to kids when they are impacted by trauma. Sure. So 20 years ago, that was kind of the reality that we thought we were living in. Yeah. Uh, we were living in a situation where we thought kids who experience trauma and abuse, their brains just get damaged and we can't really fix that. Right. Um, what we're now seeing through things like TBRI and these trauma-based principles is with loving connection and healthy relationship, 
what the wiring can actually change. Yeah. Um, these brain pathways can be restored. And so there's a lot of hope and, um, uh, for healing for some of these kids that, um, really many, if not most of these yeah. kids who have these types of traumas, the, the hard thing is when they stay with these traumas over and over and over again, and no one's intervening right. with those healthy connections and relationships, um, it makes it much harder down the road. Yeah. Um, and so the reality that these kids can't heal is just not true. Yeah. Um, they just need you <laughs> to yeah. do it. Right, um, right. You're that missing link. And yeah. so um, when people tell us that, we say, no, that's not true. You yeah. be the way that they, um, sort of the avenue toward their healing. And maybe we can give like a, a commercial for TBRI here for a second, but like yeah. uh, TBRI is trust-based relational, uh, relational intervention, right? I got yep. that right. Mm-hmm. Yes, yes. Um, and it is, uh, it, it's, well, let me say this. I'll speak from personal experience. So our staff has been through TBRI training and it's fun. Mm-hmm. Like, and what I mean by that is like, it's, it's a really interesting window into how to respond to someone, not just a child. I mean, yeah. it's designed for children. Absolutely. But we employ TBRI principles in our restorative care work here at Elijah rising with adults. Yeah. Right. And, but I went through the training and I went home and I was like, I'm going to do this to my kids. <laughs> you know what I yeah. mean? And so like you learn or all these, your wife or husband, or, like you could yeah, kinda, right. Or my this, coworkers this sometimes. Yeah. Um, and so, uh, you know, and so like it, it is it is a great training that's very accessible. I think anybody can do it. Anybody yeah. can be trained in it. Um, and so that's a, that's a big that's that's. I want to say it's an easy thing to do. Um, maybe that's an overstatement, but it is something that anybody I think anybody yeah. can do um, to help. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And that's one thing that we're um, also sort of, we're doing a lot of things. We're also trying to work toward um, getting trauma training in the hands of educators. More sure. So pediatricians, um, yeah. more the people who are having eyes on these kids and have any sort of connection with kids in care, uh, whether it be judges, whether sure. it be attorneys, whether it be, you know, all of these people need to understand um, what connection can do for a kid. Yeah. yeah. Um, and so that that is it's something that we are really working towards. There's not enough here in Houston. There's not enough um, professionals who are trained to see that a kid through the lens of their trauma. And so they go to psychiatrists, they go to therapists who are there seeing them through the lens of their behavior over and over and over again saying the behavior needs to be fixed. The behavior needs to be fixed. And so, you know, they give them diagnoses, they give them medication, they give them all these things. Um, when the reality is if they're seen through the lens of their trauma, it's not so much, you know, why are you doing that? But what happened to you in your past, um, that's causing you to act like this and what is the need behind that and how can, how, how can somebody step in to help you together? um, Yeah. Again, just from my own experience, like becoming trauma informed has only made me feel more empowered and more empathetic to help yeah. people in need or to help people with trauma. And the truth yeah. is we have a podcast episode about this. I think actually a couple of them, we all have trauma, <laughs> right? It's true. If it's you're true. human, right? Uh, varying degrees, right? And I, I assume a lot of the kids that you guys, you know, are working with and, you know, our clientele, you know, are experiencing something called complex, mm-hmm. uh, you know, trauma. But um, yeah, it's like, it, this is not, we, we, Again, like the community can participate in this if we understand trauma and start responding to one another with in in the way in the way that we deserve to respond to one another, yeah. right? Just being loving your neighbor. I, I think that's what I've come back to again. It's like just be be a good neighbor, right? What about some other misconceptions or, or roadblocks that you guys come up against? Um, I'd say the the biggest one that we see uh, when in terms of the river, if we go back to that, yeah is that biological families don't love their children because that is a, what people think uh, when you hear, oh, a child's in foster oh. care. Their biological parents probably just don't love them. They hit them. They abuse them. Um, and so one of the things that we've been trying to, to talk to you know, churches and, and people engaged with this is when we're looking at the river, hmm. when we talk about going upstream, it's not necessarily an issue of we're not going to find these stable parents who are on the side of the river yeah. who are just throwing their kids in, right? They're not just on the side of the, the river saying, I can't handle this anymore. I'm just going to throw my kids in the yeah. river. And then they go into foster care. The reality of the situation is that there are biological parents who are in the river themselves yeah, right. who are trying to make sense of the world with their own trauma 
um, and trying to make ends meet and they can't keep their kids above the water. Yeah, sure. That's the reality of what's happening. And so it's not necessarily an issue of these people don't love their children. Um, they want to abuse them. Yeah. And it, it's more an issue of they're not equipped to parent. Yeah. Um, and so I think understanding that helps us to understand and re- remember that biological parents need help. Yeah. Um, and that's where we're going upstream. You know, so trafficking is kind of going upstream into foster care and f- within foster care, we're trying to go upstream too yeah. um, and find out how do we equip these parents mm-hmm. um, because adoption through foster care was never, that's not plan A. Um, right. that's, that's what happens when plan A doesn't work. Right. Um, and we want to see families restored, um, and reconciled and, and being able to thrive on the side of the river, um, as a stable family unit. That yeah. is the goal. Um, when that can't happen, then you know, adoption can happen and things like that. But, um, about 80% of cases in a, about 80% of child welfare cases, um, the reality is these kids go into the system because of neglect, not because of abuse. Yeah. And that's huge because, again, the misconception is that these are kids who are sexually abused or physically mm. abused. Um, but in the large majority of these cases, it's parents who can't make ends meet. Yeah. And so for a variety of reasons, um, they can't keep their kids above the water. Yeah. Um, and so that's something that we're trying to educate more on. Um, just to build that compassion yeah. around around them and and help people have a more full picture of what's happening. It's so important for all of us to humanize one another. Yeah, it's so easy to look at an injustice and start dehumanizing everyone we think is to blame. Right. And um, I hear you saying that about the parents. You know, we we have to kind of do that work around buyers and and traffickers. Yeah. It's like, look, you know, they're broken too. You know, we're not going to excuse the injustices, you know, but at the same time, like we've got to do the hard work mm-hmm. of, um, of reaching everybody, especially yeah. if we want to end the problem. Yeah. Right. Go upstream, yeah. you know, put solutions in place upstream. Yeah, what a great I mean. analogy. I feel like you've been working on that one for a while. It, yeah. We can't take credit for it. Um, there are other people who have <laughs> done, done the work before and we've kind of, um, even taken it a little bit further. Sure. So, well, yeah. I think it's great. I mean, yeah. I've got the picture. Yeah. Um, so, uh, I wonder has fostering family encountered children that have been affected by trafficking? Are there any stories? Obviously we're going to protect, you know, sure. individuals and things like that, but uh, what connections yeah. have you seen personally? Well, most of the time we, we partner with other organizations, so we don't deal as much directly with sure. kids because we're not a, li- a child placing agency right, and things like right. that. We do partner with organizations like Arrow. They have Freedom Place. Yep. Um, and so we kind of help to support their work and, and do anything that we can can to serve you know yeah, them and, and sort of equip them to do their work really well. Um, I will say, you know, just a few days ago, I did have a conversation from a fellow, another trafficking organization leader um, who called me and just said, I, I have this contact there was a, a now 19 year old who mm. was um, was in foster care, then was in trafficking. Um, so it was all kind of connected there. That was yeah. just in crisis and yeah. needed help. Um, and so we're really grateful to be in a position where when when they that sort of thing starts to happen, we can connect them to different resources. And gratefully, um, we were able to get some some resources on board and help them to figure out what to do in that situation. Yeah, absolutely. Again, this is a perfect picture of this river. Yeah. Like this is a aged out kid. Yeah. Um, and now 19 has a child has been in trafficking and prostitution. Yeah. So she's very downstream, but this, the river is about to cycle back. Right. Um, and they're saying she's in crisis. We need to help her. Yeah. Um, and that being able to, to step in, the main reason she was able to get that support and get stability was because she had a loving, stable adult. Yeah, you know, man. she had somebody who had walked with her early on, yep. who now lives way out of state, but it was still that phone call for still her. connected. Yeah. That was that was the only reason that yeah. this this girl was able to get out of the situation she was in. Yeah. Um, and find some stability and get some protection around her. Um, again, it always comes back over and over and over. It's going to come back to that loving, stable adult. Yeah. Um, if these kids don't have it it's going to, to lead to major problems. Yeah. I mean, we all need a sense of felt safety to be yeah. able to work through our stuff, you know, whatever trauma, whatever issue that is. And so what I hear you saying is like establishing that relationship is a form of felt safety to where that 19 year old had somebody to call. Mm-hmm. At least there was one person on the planet that they had a felt safety with. And you can break that cycle from going back upstream, back up the river yeah. um, and creating it all over again. I wonder, um, 
Amber, if you consider fostering family, if you consider the nonprofit uh, and its volunteers and its its stakeholders, whomever they may be, a part of the solution to end trafficking, a part of the solution to fight trafficking, whether that's here in Houston or globally or whatever the case may be. Yeah, I hope so. <laughs> Great answer. Otherwise, I'm <laughs> spinning my wheels a little bit. Yeah. Um, well, what, say more. What do you mean by that? Yeah, I hope that, that what we're doing is is leading to effective change upstream, midstream, downstream, and yeah. kind of working to coordinate. Um, I would say just we're just a part of it. Mm. Um, and so, I mean, I hope that what we're doing is really, really good work. I yeah. hope people can see that. Um, the work we're doing with with group homes, the work that we're doing to support families, the work we're doing in the wealth, child welfare system. I hope that we do that excellently, and yeah. that we're doing it um, in a way that's not just putting band aids on a lot of things, but we're actually looking at it from a broad perspective of what is actually going to fix this. Um, but at the same time, we're just a piece of it, and sure. the beauty of it, like we said before, the beauty of it is that there's not going to be one one organization or one program that, that fixes all of this. Yeah, um, we need each it's, other. It's going to be all of us. Yeah. And so, I, I mean, yeah, to answer your question, I hope that we're doing really yeah. good things, um, but I hope other people kind of jump into that with us and um, can play a role. Yeah. Well, we're certainly appreciative of the role that you're playing, and it's been great getting to kind of know you and the work that Fostering yeah. Family is doing. It really is. You know, uh, for us, obviously, our focus is trafficking, and, I mean, it, we're just we're just aware every day that, like, it it is um, such a multifaceted issue. Uh, as And as you stated kind of on the front end, you know, fostering um, – is the same is the same deal um there's it's just such a multifaceted issue and so i just think it's important for our listeners and viewers to understand that like if we want to put an end to these broken systems or if we want to bring solutions to these broken systems maybe it's a better way to put it that we have to all come together and we have to all attack the issues from different facets and every uh, not to put words in your mouth but i would assume you would say that everyone no matter who they are has a place in this work and has a role has a role to play yeah um well i want to thank you i want to thank you for being here today i want to thank you for taking the time to share with us today um and so as i always do with our guests at the end of these podcasts i just want to kind of give you some space uh, if there's anything you know that you you think I haven't covered, any any question I should have asked and haven't asked, I want you to have <laughs> have the space to articulate that uh, here and now, and you know maybe that our our um, our, our folks that are listening uh, that you think that they need to hear. Yeah, it's a very broad question. <laughs> um, one of the things that has come to our attention just in the last couple of weeks that I think the community should know about yeah. um, and hopefully can step into. Um, so we talked about kids who are in group homes. Mm. We talked about kids who are in families. There's also this little group of kids um, who are in between. So it may be that they're at a group home, they run away and they don't have another placement. Mm. could be a situation where um, they call CPS and say, I don't want to be here anymore. Mm. I don't want to be at this foster home or whatever. Um, It may be that a certain situation caused, you know, a kid to not be a good fit for the place where they are and they're just in between. Or a kid goes into, you know, their family's being investigated, they need to be removed, and there's just not a place for them. Yeah. Um, So they kind of call this children without placement. They're just sort of in an in-between phase. And on any given day, there could be, um, I got a text earlier, there were 10 10 in what they call CWAP, children without placement. Wow. 10 kids in Houston, in Harris County, who don't have a placement at night, um, and they don't know what to do with them. So it can be, I've heard it being up to 15 or 16 at any given time. Oh, my goodness. Um, with COVID, it's yeah, driving up. I'm sure. Um, kids are struggling in these homes. Um, they're they're having more mental health issues for all of us, really, but for kids who yeah. have been, already had trauma and they're stuck at home, locked down, it makes it a lot harder um, for them to process all of this. So all that to say, there's the, lots of kids who are in um, this kind of CWAP program mm-hmm. on any given night. Um, what I was told was... CPS has had two facilities in all of Harris County to place these kids, places where they they have to be kind of volunteered. So there's one wow. church on the east side, I believe, that's offered some space. So they use that that facility. There was one other place uh, that just this week said, 
we can't do it anymore. My so there's goodness. one place now that they can send kids to. And if you can imagine 10, 15 kids being placed and they're in this situation, they're in crisis, it's not going to go well. Um, and so we have been really trying to think through just honestly, just this week, trying to figure out there's got to be more spaces for these kids. Gosh, um, yeah. And again, if it's con- going to continue to drive up until we can, again, go upstream to figure out why are these kids running? Why are yeah. these kids not in a stable placement? We've got to figure out that piece and we're working on it. But for the current crisis situation, um, there are kids who have to be placed somewhere. Yeah. Um, caseworkers have to be with them 24 seven because it's not a specific placement. So all it is is offering a location with a bed and a room for the um, child and the caseworker. For the child, the caseworker's just there, right? Um, just present, ob- like obviously not sleeping or anything, just yeah, yeah, there. Yeah. And CPS workers just kind of go on shifts to, to be there as as long as these kids are are in this program. Yeah. Um, so, really, what we have to find is, I think, five or six locations where these kids can be placed because Mm. again, having that many kids in one location is not going to be good. But if there's two or three available places for multi, you know, across the city, this gives CPS an, an ability to have somewhere to go. Um, and it's not placed on just one facility. So that's something that we've noticed is a really big need that we want to be able to figure out. Um, and so we've got, we've gone to churches. We're going to anyone that has any sort of facility. Yeah, do you have a could, roof? Do you have a room? <laughs> yeah, are yeah, placed yeah. with a couple of rooms. And we've seen, you know, there are churches that are not back open yet. You yeah, know, there sure, are, sure. Granted, there's, there are risks involved that sure. they have to, to understand, but there's got to be in all of Harris County, some places um, where we can figure out how to, to, you know, make them work. So, wow. We're looking at that. Um, again, it, it goes back to the the whole community playing a role. And if there's anyone out there yeah, who no. has a, you know, some sort of a facility uh, yeah. that can house kids for a temporary, on a very temporary basis, um, there are community partners who can provide meals. There are community partners who can provide bedding and beds. You just need a location. We just need locations. Yeah. So, well, the last question I always ask is, you know, how can we support your work right now? So I think you've yeah. kind of already shifted into that. You if you are out there and you have a facility, uh, yeah. So what else though? How how else yeah. can we support what you guys are doing right now? Um, yeah, I think we can. What can you do? What can you do? If you know a foster family, uh, if you know a kinship family, like we talked about before. Yeah. Know them, see them, love yeah. them, support them. Um, we have tools on our, and resources on our, our website um, that will make it really easy for you to support them. Um, we have a foster family profile form that makes it very easy to know how to step in. What's the website address? Uh, www.fostering-family.org. Okay. Um, we also have a resource page on there. So all of that slash resource. Resource. Perfect. Um there is, we just made that resource page live. It um, okay. has all kinds of resources for foster families, um, educational resources. We have um, pediatricians, um, foster care clinics around the city. Um, any fo- any um, foster care liaisons are available in every school district, and we have all of them listed um, okay. for families who are needing some educational support. Um, and then any support group, parent night out, um, church community that's engaged in this, all of those are listed on a map, oh, other wow. non-co- uh, nonprofits. Um, so, and we also have um, a current foster family resource guide. That's just like a 25 page document on all kinds of stuff um, wow. that current foster families might benefit from. Yeah. A lot of that was just when we were fostering, it was everything that I wish that I had known yeah, yeah. put into one document. It's awesome. um, and if it's not in there, there's a link probably to where you can find it. Sure. Yeah. Um, and so I think finding foster families or the ones that you know, getting them connected to that type of support, um, you're always welcome to send them to us if they have a need um, that you don't feel like you can meet on your own. Um, the other thing that I would say is um, if you're a part of a church and or some sort of co- community, you're a community leader in some way, and you want to find out more about um, getting involved, um, using what you have, whatever it is that you have yeah. to steward, sure. um, and you want to use it in this space, reach out to us, um, and we will definitely find a place um, in whatever neighborhood you're in. Yeah, awesome. Yeah. 
Well, Amber, I want to say thank you again. Um, also, I just scrolled past your bio and realized that you're a fellow Baylor Bear, so sick them. Sick them. Sick them Bears. Sick uh, em Bears. Number one rated basketball team in the nation at the moment. Um, thanks for being here today. Yeah. Thanks and, for having uh, me. And thanks for sharing your heart. Thanks for sharing your work. We appreciate you. We see you guys. Thanks. Uh, and we're very Same. thankful for you. So um, you've given us a lot. Uh, it, one more thing. Sorry. Uh, where can people find you? Other than the website, you guys have a phone number, an address, an uh, email address. Where can, if they want to contact you right now, how can they do that? Email address, amber at fostering-family.org. <laughs> Social media? Yep, Instagram, you can find us. Facebook, you can find us. LinkedIn, if you do that, we're on there. Um, <laughs> I don't really understand exactly why I don't really do much on there. We're but on there too, so, you know, yeah, LinkedIn. Um, pretty much any social media. We're not on Twitter. Um, okay, cool. We're not, you yeah. know, revolting or anything like that. For any reason, <laughs> just we're just there. not there yeah. yet. Um, <laughs> That's great. But, yeah, Instagram, Facebook. <laughs> awesome. We, uh, you can find us there. All right. Thanks yeah, for thank being you. here today, Amber. Hey, thank you for tuning in to the Elijah Rising podcast today. If you found any value in this content, we ask that you would help further our work by subscribing to this channel and liking this video. As well, we would love to know what you think. So go ahead and comment below if you have any thoughts or reactions or questions. We read them all and we'll respond to as many as we can. Thanks again for viewing and we'll see you on the next episode of the Elijah Rising podcast.